Yeah, I, I think it's all speculative. Then I don't think they have any sources for it. It's all speculative. You want to make a bridge? So I want to yeah. share a video with you that I watched, that where it showed like a lot of like of these early polytheistic Babylonian religions and stuff, and then the connection with the Torah. I watched this. I'm like, this is ridiculous, but like. Yeah, but you see, what one of the things that they leave out is what we call Torah Shabbat Peh. They're, they have an axiom. They're, an idea is only as old as the first writing that records it. So if they have writings from Babylonia that are earlier from the writings of the Torah, then they say the Babylonian idea is older. But we know that the ideas that we have go back to the patriarchs 300 years before. Oh, they don't, but they don't take account of that. They want to see where it's first written down. Hammurabi's code. Right? It wasn't brand new to the Israelites when they got it in, in the Torah. It was something which was already known to the, to the patriarchs. It was taught, uh, taught by them and practiced by them. Our tradition tells us that they kept the, the laws of the Torah. So our ideas are much older than the first Jewish writing in which they occur. If they assume that an idea is no older than the first writing, then they are not dating our ideas correctly. Because mm, there was an oral tradition before written. Of course, of course. Wow. And the truth is, the same would be true in general of all writings. Who says the writing originates the idea? Maybe the writing is writing down an idea that has been in... And maybe there were early writings that you didn't find. But the whole thing is, is, is fantasy. That the oldest one that I found is the one is when I say it came into existence. What you really should say is I don't know when it came into existence. But they don't do that. Within your book, you mentioned how like the Karaites and these like other sects of Judaism that like only followed the Torah but not the oral tradition, it's not how they kind of faded out or in yeah. small numbers. Do you think the reason is like divine? Like Absolutely. That's part of my argument that, that we are subject to divine providence. 100%. Wow. Exciting stuff, man. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's see where we are here. Well, no, because I went from chapter to chapter. Okay. So this is chapter six, which I started a few days ago. I think I have it. I have it. Okay, good. So we're on page four. Page four. Page, page four. So what the Rambam has said so far is that we have free will, and there are verses in the Tanakh in various places which say that God takes, uh, causes people to do something or prevents people from doing something, don't take them as a statement of the general Jewish con uh, human condition. There are exceptions. There are exceptions when the crimes that they have committed are so great that justice requires that they be punished. And there's a divine principle that anyone who does tshuva won't be punished. So therefore, somehow, it has to be guaranteed that the punishment will occur, and that's guaranteed by preventing them from doing tshuva. And this applies to both Jews and non-Jews, and there are verses that, that apply to both, which he brings. Um, now, he reinforces this with a, um, a number of verses which show that whether or not you'll be capable of tshuva 
requires divine assistance. And a wise person will think that sometimes God does take away free will. And it also might be a matter of degree. Cases that we've been citing have been absolute, where God takes away free will entirely. But there may be cases where it makes it harder to do tshuva or easier to do tshuva, which the Rambam does codify exactly, actually. And that being the case, great people throughout history pleaded with Akadosh Baruch Hu, please help me do tshuva, help me understand what, what needs to be done, help me have the courage to face it, and so forth and so on. Now, this is where charts with paragraph four, on page, on page four. <coughs> This is what is implied in the requests of the righteous and the prophets in their prayers. Asking God to help them on the path to truth. Now, a path to truth can be taken two ways. One is a path to arriving at true beliefs and true information. And the second way you could take it is to walk on the path that truth dictates, which is the, the path of doing Torah and mitzvot, and in particular, in our case, doing tshuva. So he has in, in, in Tehillim, in Psalms, God, show me your way that I may walk in your truth. The Rambam takes this at least to include, do not let my sins prevent me from reaching the path of truth, which will lead me to appreciate your way and the oneness of your name. Now, I think we have to understand this uh, in sort of in relative, relative terms. Pharaoh had his free will taken away, the free will to send out the Jews. It doesn't follow that he lost free will entirely. Maybe he had free will to punish a slave or not punish a slave or, or, other, or, or other things. That won't make a difference to his being punished. If he'll punish a slave and later say, oh, I shouldn't have done that, it was a little too cruel, and so forth and so on, and therefore I'm, I regret that I've, de I've done it, and so forth and so on, and I won't do it again, that's not going to save him from punishment, because the punishment that we're talking about is the punishment of not letting the Jews go. That's the punishment that God wants to save for him. So it doesn't follow that he has to become a total robot. This, this is uh, the same point is made in, in other places as well. But I think that, so King David is not saying, Gee, I think maybe I'm in Pharaoh's position that I have to be punished and I'm going to be prevented to chew it and I'm going to lose my life and I'm going to be annihilated. I doubt that that was one of King David's worries, that he was as bad as Pharaoh. But there could be aspects of God's truth where God says, you don't deserve to have the information and the inspiration to do this part of my service. I'm not going to let you have it. So King David says, so what you see is that God will do this for some people on occasion depending upon their performance. Similar intent is conveyed by the request, support me with a spirit of magnanimity. Let my spirit be willing to do your will and do not cause my sins to prevent me from repenting. And again, it doesn't mean that prevent him from repenting for everything and he'll become just like an animal, but King David wants to be able to repent for everything that's gone wrong. And to be prevented from repenting for any, any one thing for King David would be a terrible tragedy. We've said before, uh, the great, a great, shall I say, impact of tshuva is that even though you make mistakes, you have the ability to rectify them, so you leave the world with a perfect record, even though during your lifetime you did make mistakes. The King David says, I want to have the ability to do tshuva and to rectify the mistakes that I've made, and I don't want my ability to do tshuva to be impaired in any way. I'm asking God that that should, that should be the case. Um, rather, let the choice remain in my hand until I do tshuva and comprehend and appreciate the path of truth. In a similar way, must interpret all the verses that resemble these when Someone's being, when someone's asking for help, it at least includes help in being able to do tshuva. Um, now, a similar conclusion is, ba is based on a different verse that uh, King David's. What was implied by King David's statement, God is good and upright. 
Therefore, he instructs sinners in the path. He guides the humble in the path of justice, teaches the humble his way. So here, he's told us that a person can reach the enormous level of evil that God will prevent him from doing tshuva. But that's only the ones who have reached a gigantic magnitude which condemns them. God's general policy is, because he is good and upright, he instructs sinners in the path, he guides the humble. Now here is a, is a qualification. It's specifically the humble. Um, let's just check the Hebrew here for a second. Yeah, Anavim, right, same thing. He sends the prophets to inform them of the path of God and to encourage them to repent. Now, I just want to insert here something which, I don't know if it's, if it's common knowledge or not. Uh, the Torah that we have, we have, we call, we call the Torah, which is from Moses. I, there's the, all the books of the prophets and all the books of the writings, which is a kind of Holy Spirit and so on and so forth. If the Torah comes from Moses, what are they doing? So we have a principle. No mitzvah can come to the Jewish people from any source other than Moses. Whenever a mitzvah in the Talmud is traced back to a, a, a verse in the prophets, the Talmud always says, that can't be the source for it. Isaiah could not give any commandments to the Jewish people. Jeremiah could not give any commandments to the Jewish people. They come only from Moses. Now let's suppose you have written in the book of Isaiah certain instructions that aren't in the Torah of Moses. So the answer is that they were in the oral tradition and they were not written down in the Torah of Moses and therefore Isaiah preached them to the people, told the people, you know very well, that from Moses we had the instruction to do X, Y, Z. And if you're not going to do X, Y, Z, you're going to be punished for it. Not that Isaiah is inventing the rule. He's using the rule in order to warn them. And on the contrary, the fact that he's using the rule in order to warn them means that it was common knowledge. Otherwise, you couldn't warn them. First, you'd have to tell them, guess what? There are new rules, and these new rules have to be, have to be followed. But no, it was, it was well known. And, and to, just to put this in, in appropriate perspective, what came first, the written Torah or the oral Torah? People have the, the impression that, well, there was a document, and then there were comments and applications and interpretations of the document. The document came first, and what we call the oral, which accompanies it, is later. That's exactly wrong. It's explicit in the Torah itself. There was the Ten Pronouncements at Sinai, which all the whole Jewish people heard. And then Moses went up on the mountain and came down with vast amounts of Torah information. And the Torah says, this week's parasha, the Torah says that at the end of his life, Moses wrote down the book. So he was teaching there for 40 years. And he wrote down the book at the end of his life. The oral comes first. Rav Hirsch makes an analogy of the written to the oral like lecture notes. If you go to a lecture and you take notes on the lecture, and let's suppose somebody who wasn't at the lecture got hold of your notes, would he be able to reconstruct the lecture from your notes? I hope not, because if he could, you're not good at taking notes. The point of the notes is that you who were at the lecture will remember what was said because of what you write down on the paper. You don't write it down verbatim, not write it down word for word. Let's suppose the professor says something, you write it down, and later on he says, this is very important, so you underline it. Someone who wasn't there, look at the underline, won't know what it means. You remember that it's very important. You write down the line. You know what the line means. Other people don't know what the line means. So the oral tradition comes first. It is a favorite trick of Christian missionaries to say to a, a, a Jew who's not too well educated, you believe X, right? That's part of your, your Judaism, right? Where is it in your Bible? Find it in your Bible. Can't find it? That means it was made up. See, your Bible and your religion aren't, aren't reliable. Poor Jew doesn't know that there was an oral tradition, not all of which was written down, and was communicated orally, 
And this is where you find also in the verses of the prophets ideas that aren't in, in Moses, Moses' Torah because it was, it was orally there, it was known by the people, and they used it to exhort them, to encourage them to do what a Kosh Baruch Hu wants. So that's what the prophets are for. They're there to tell the people, this is what you're doing right, and this is good, this is what you're doing wrong, this is the danger that you are you're running by what you're doing. Sometimes the, the, the prophet can give them instruction what to do on the spot. He can tell them, I have God's authority to tell you that this, this is what you must do now, but not another mitzvah. That he cannot do. So the, the Rabbim says it's God's way to instruct sinners in the, in the path. He does so by sending their prophets. Now, from the fact that God sends them prophet, that implies that he granted them the power to learn and to understand. No point, and I, I, I find this astonishing. I once went through the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is very high, difficult poetry. If you read it with the commentaries, you struggle to make sense of it. You have to imagine Isaiah giving a public lecture. And hundreds of people are there. And I ask myself, who are these people? They're listening to this? And they understand it? They really must have been at a very high level. This was a public performance. So the very fact that God sent the prophets to give these speeches implies that he's dealing with a population, at least some part of which can understand it and take, and take instruction from it. This attribute is present in all men. Uh, the, the ability to learn and understand new ideas and to apply them. As long as a person follows the ways of wisdom and righteousness, he will desire them and pursue them. This may be inferred from the statement of our sages, one who comes to purify himself is helped, i.e. finds himself assisted in this matter. So it's the way of men to do this, but you have to understand that there's a divine hand in your, in your performance of it. This, this statement from the Talmud, which, um, which the Rabbim quotes, he, he quotes only half of it, because only, he only needs half of it here, but it's very indicative. Someone who comes to purify himself. Please help me understand your way, God. Please help me have the inspiration to, to follow that way, to, to, uh, to incorporate it, to, to, um, to uh, use it to in, inform. That means to create a form for me, inform me. A person who wants to do that will get divine help. The other half of the statement is, Habolatame, someone who wants to defile himself, poschinlo. The door is opened for him. Doesn't say he's helped. If he, if he wants to defile himself, he's got to walk through the door himself. He's not going to get any divine help for that. Of course not. Why would God help him defile himself? But he won't be prevented. You have free will. But if he wants to purify himself, then he'll have divine help. So this is part of what's the, I meant by sending the prophets to explain and to inspire and sometimes to warn and to threaten, all of which is helping the person to purify himself. Yeah? Well, what, to what point do you really need the person with, with, with divine help kick in? These types of principles are not quantitative. And the reason they're not quantitative is because they depend upon a myriad of factors, many of which we're not aware of, and even the person himself may not be aware of. If this happens to, to a parent, what would be the effect on his children? That has to be taken into account. And what about his parents who are looking at him, and his parents have earned a certain amount of merit? If this will happen to him, his parents will be disappointed, they God has to take into account. Do they deserve to be disappointed? And if not, then that will be a reason that it shouldn't happen to him. So you're not going to be able to quantify because God takes into account an unlimited myriad of factors that are, uh, you know, that are relevant. Um, all we can know is that there is such a principle of helping, and then, like everything else in the world, if you know that it's possible, then you can take it into account in your decisions. You don't have to know that it's necessary or certain. You know, surgery isn't necessary and certain. Mistakes are made and terrible things happen. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do surgery. 
if the probabilities are that you'll be better off with the surgery, then you take it because you know that surgery does help. It helps often, and therefore it's worthwhile to do it. So you don't have to, be, to know for sure whether it's going to happen or not. When you know that that's one of the ways that God de deals with the world, then you ask for it and you hope to receive it. Yeah. So within the situation, like, would a man's Yitzhahara be, you know, subdued? Or, like, what's the relate? Like, when we say that he's helped, like, how, can you expand on that further? <coughs> well, there are two things to say here. You know, divine providence leads us through life. Now, you can think of it this way. It leads us from decision to decision, from test to test. When you make a free will decision, some are easier and some are harder, and it's always some kind of test. And depending on what you've done and what the circumstances are, you'll be led to the next test because that's the next step in your, in your uh, development. Um, you may have, let's say, an uncontrolled evil inclination for X, but God can gerrymander your, your life so that you never come in contact with X. You may not even know that you have such a, a Yetzirah because it's never been triggered. So uh, it depends on what God wants for your next step in, in, uh, in and, and you can be led into circumstances where certain, certain types of Yetzirah are, are dampened and greatly reduced. When you, when you come to yeshiva, you, you know this from your own experience, it's quite different from, from being in Manhattan. Some things that can be in Manhattan overwhelming over here, you never even think of them. So he makes yeshivas available, number one, and then you make a choice <laughs> to take a position in yeshiva that already is going to reduce greatly the impact of that yet sorrow. Now, you may get married, and you may have to be responsible to support your family, and then you'll have to move to a different environment where different Yetzirahs will become stronger again. So that's part of life's uh, variability. But what you know is if you ask God for help in dealing with this, and certainly not to close the door in front of you against doing tshuva, that's something which, which uh, if you're not really a terrible criminal, he will do. Okay, so on to page five. A new type of challenge to the idea of free will. We have in the covenant that God made with Abraham. God says to him, you should know that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not their own. And they shall oppress them and oppress, uh, enslave them and oppress them. That's the local inhabitants shall enslave and oppress your descendants. Now, let's see. When did that happen? That happened in Egypt. Jacob and his family went down to Egypt, and for many years everything was fine. But when Jacob and all of his sons died, then the situation started to deteriorate to the point where about 90 years before the Exodus, they, were, they became enslaved, and they were enslaved for about 90 years. Now, God told Abraham that they're going to be enslaved and oppressed. So, did the Egyptians have any choice not to do it? Doesn't this seem like a divine decree? He started this chapter by saying, there's no divine decree that a person shall do good or shall do evil. Here it seems that the Egyptians are acting due to a divine decree. And although, um, well, no, no, I'll, I'll leave that. That's wrong, but at any rate, that, so here you have a prediction that they will do, and that sounds like it is a decree. Similarly, coming up in, 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 in Parashat Shavuot, this nation, meaning the future Jews, will arise and stray after the alien gods of the land. Here it says, God is telling through Moses, that this is what's going to happen. This seems that he decreed that Israel was their idols. And then we're going to ask, why did he punish them? And I think the why did he punish them goes both on the Egyptians and the Jews. If it was God's decree that they do these things which are evil, why should they be punished? 
That's how he started chapter five. That the uh, chapter five that the the morality of God's reward and punishment requires that we have free will. You can't punish somebody for breaking a rule if he had no choice but to, but to break it. He had no alternative because he was programmed or forced to, to break it. You cannot you cannot punish him for that. So now comes an answer for which we are going to have to an, a, examine carefully. Rama says, because he did not decree that a particular person would be the one who strayed. Rather, each and every one of those who strayed to idol worship could have chosen not to serve idols if he did not desire to serve them. The Creator really informed Moses of the pattern of the world. Now, here, this, the, the, the Rambam needs a lot of work because in these few words, it sounds like the Rambam has said two different things. And we're going to have to try to unravel this. One thing he said is, when he's telling him, they will, the Egyptians, the Egyptians doesn't mean every last Egyptian. Not every last Egyptian became an oppressor of the Jewish slaves. When he says the Jews will serve other gods, it doesn't mean that every last Jew will serve the other gods. It means a substantial proportion of the population. So one thing he's saying is, a general statement like that is not a decree on any particular individual that he should do these things, and therefore it's not an excuse for the individual who does it. The first statement he's making is, there's a difference between general statements and specific statements. If God had named individuals, that would have been a problem. But he didn't name individuals, so we'll have to work on that. Second thing he does, which is more subtle, he, he starts the paragraph, this little three and a half word line paragraph, he says that he did not decree, and then he's merely informed. That sounds like the statement has a different character from what we thought. We took the statement as a decree. A decree is something that God makes happen. And now we say, no, God didn't make it happen. He just informed Moses that it was going to happen. These are two separate ideas. I'm going to explain the first one today. The second one I'm unsure about as to whether it's really meant this way. But, but the, I'm going to I'm try to explain the, the, the first one, whether it's, whether it's general and, and individual. First, let the Rambam fi finish his explanation, and then I'll try to add some clarification. To what can this be compared? To someone who says... There will be righteous and wicked people in this nation. Any nation. In any future. There will be some who are good and some who are bad. A wicked person later cannot say that because God molds, told them there will be wicked people, it is decreed that he will be wicked. Now he's back to the decree. But that doesn't follow. Even if you called it a decree, that there will be some righteous, some wicked, if it doesn't have Ruvain's name on it, he can't claim that he was wicked because of that decree because he wasn't named in the decree. A similar concept uh, applies regarding this statement, the poor will never cease to exist in the land. It doesn't mean everyone will be poor in the land, and it doesn't mean that this particular poor person was decreed that he should be poor. It's just that there will be poor people in the land. Similarly, in regard to the Egyptians, each and every one of the Egyptians who caused hardship and difficulty for Israel had the choice to refrain from harming them, if he so desired. For there was no decree on a particular person that you will be a taskmaster of punishing Jews. It was just, there will be taskmasters done in punishing Jews. Rather, God, now again, he switched to informed Abraham, that the future descendants will be enslaved to the land which did not belong to them. Okay, so now, as I said, there are two different things going on here. And I want to start with just the general versus the, versus the specific. So he, let's imagine a dialogue. This Egyptian comes before, you know, after death comes before the throne of, of, uh, of justice and says, you enslaved Jews, you punished Jews, you persecuted Jews, you're going to get it. <laughs> you're going to get it. That was terrible. It's a terrible crime. He says, God, aren't you fair? You yourself decreed that the Jews should be persecuted. And God says, I didn't say you should do it. So you have no excuse 
that I said it. The natural response of the Egyptian to God is what? But if everyone had chosen not to do it, what would have happened to your decree? So it wasn't that it could be totally avoided. And I was the one who carried it out. Question is, how is God going to respond to that claim? Let me give you an example, which I think is parallel and maybe be easier to think about because it's a simple, direct example. And then I'll explain to you what I think the, the principle is here. Ten people are imprisoned by the king. And the king says, I've decided to show my mercy to the ten of you. I'm going to make you run a race. The first four who come in um, will be released. The last six will be killed. And you have to run, run the race in an hour. If you come in third or fourth, but you, it took more than an hour, you don't make it. You've got to be in the first four un, in under an hour. So they line up, and they run. Okay? And what happens is, after the first hour, three make it, and seven don't. Huh. And let's imagine that physically all ten were able. So the three go, they're released. And the king says, seven of you are going to die. One of the seven says, this is grossly unfair. This is grossly unjust. And the king says, why? You could have made it. You could have made it. I know you could have. And you know you could have made it. You were just lazy. So at this point, I think the king has a point. I said four. Only three made it. You could have made it. You could have been the fourth. Why are you complaining? If you had run faster, you would have made it. So this guy says, well, yeah, that's true. I could have made it. But then if I had made it, that would have sealed the fate of the other six. And of course, the king says it to each of the other six also. You could have made it. You could have made it. You could have made it. Singly, he says to each one, you could have made it. And their response is, well, we couldn't all have made it. And here's what I think the king should say back. I didn't think you should say back. You're complaining about, this is very similar to what I said about, I about virtual worlds. Either. You're complaining about a world that didn't happen. You're saying that if you had made it, the other six would have been condemned, and that's unfair. So what? That isn't what happened. You're now extending moral judgment to a virtual world which didn't happen. But in the real world, only three made it, and one slot was open, and you could have made it. So in the real world, nothing unfair is going on. You're questioning my general morals about what I would have done in a false world? Okay, that's, take that up in your philosophy class. But that's no defense for you. So what if not everybody could have made it? You could have done it, and therefore you're responsible for your actions. certain people to fulfill as a vessel an evil act. For example, when the brothers sell Joseph to the Egyptians, that's an act of evil, but then Joseph sees that that act was meant to happen for the family to go to Egypt and survive. So how come the act of evil was set upon, they fulfilled it, and uh, but it was meant to happen? So I think that's a mistake in understanding the event. Uh, first of all, when Jacob dies, and when the, the brothers come back from burying him, they send a message to Joseph, please don't punish us for the evil thing that we did, and we're prepared to be your slaves, and so forth and so on. What does Joseph say to them? Atem chashavtem alai halukim He says, you thought to do me evil, but God made it something that turned out to be good. So part of what he's saying is, you didn't hurt me. On the contrary, what you did benefited me. So you're expecting me to take revenge? Certainly not. What you did to me 
only turned out good. But he starts his words with, you thought to do me evil. Why does he put that in? Because he says, there are two aspects to your action. One aspect is hurting me. That didn't happen. But the other aspect is, you did something which God wouldn't want you to do. That's between you and God. I can't forgive you for that. That's not my realm. That you still owe to God. You thought to do me evil. So what you did was wrong. I, you say, it worked out well. God has many, many different ways in which to make it work out. It didn't have to happen through his being sold. Maharam says it in the Gemara. It, it, it could have happened that he was invited down as a delegation for the political consultations and brought his family along. It didn't have to happen through, through Joseph being sold. It wasn't limited to that. But people make a mistake when Joseph ex- forgives them and says, I'm not taking revenge, as if that means that what they, did, what they did wasn't wrong. It definitely was wrong. It definitely was wrong. Indeed, they explained the ten martyrs who were killed by the Romans as punishment for that crime. So uh, it, it's simply not a, not a good example. God mm-hmm. does not decree that people should do evil, does not force people to do evil. With the one exception of forcing them not to do tshuva when he wants to punish them, as, as we have as we've just uh, said. You had a question in the back? No. Um, what about uh, referring to Rambam uh, saying that uh, in, in our knowledge, Shem's knowledge is not dependent upon our actions? So how can uh, how can we how can we decree that those uh, we, we first decree that we just don't understand uh, Shem at all, or we uh, rather the thing that we did before? Yeah. Right, but th- now wait a second. There, there are actually three possible things to say here. One is that God's knowledge depends upon what we do. The second is that God's knowledge doesn't depend upon what we do, and He knows, and He knows in His own way. That's the second possible thing to say. And the third possible thing to say is what the Rambam says, that we don't say he knows. So, and the problem is that if you hold the second position, then you're stuck with the problem that we don't have free will. Well, those are three possible things to say about God's knowledge. Now, we said, according to the Rambam, we don't say that God knows, but he has all the capabilities of a knower. He just doesn't do it through what we, what we call knowledge. So if you're asking how can God inform Abraham about the future if we don't say he has knowledge? That's precisely what we're saying. We're saying he has all the capabilities that knowledge would give him, but those capabilities aren't delivered to him through knowledge. They're delivered to him in some way that we can't imagine. So of course he can inform of the future. He isn't ignorant of the future. We said if you don't describe God, you don't say he knows, and you don't say he's ignorant. You don't say either of those things. You stop talking. You leave open that God is a reality that we don't understand. That reality gives him certain capabilities, and they include all the capabilities that knowledge would give us. And that's why he's able to tell Abraham what the future is going to going to what's going to happen in the future. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but that's that's what occurs to me from what you said. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So now. That, so that's the idea here. That God says to the Egyptian, I only decree that there should be persecution. You didn't have to do it for there to be persecution. The Egyptian says back, but if everybody, you're going to ch- ch- say this to everybody, if everybody had decided not to persecute, there wouldn't that have been. And, and uh, I believe that uh, the uh, Kodesh Baruch's answer can be, look, I'm accusing you of a crime. You certainly could have been, uh, t- taken a different course. You know that. You admit that. And therefore, you're guilty of your crime. What would have been in a universe, a virtual universe, in which everybody decided to be good? And you say, because I'm running the world, I would have to make them do the bad thing? That's interesting. But you have no complaints about what really happened. You have no complaints about what happened in the real world. In the real world, I didn't make anybody do anything. How to answer the virtual world? Sign up for Philosophy 66. You know. <laughs> That's not a complaint that saves you. It's not a complaint that you can use in your defense. Because your defense has to be based on the real world, not on a virtual world. So I think that could be one way of understanding what the Rambam is saying here directly. 
Okay. Okay. So let's see if we're just about finished here. Yeah, and he ends the, the paragraph with the words, we've already explained that it's beyond the potential of man to know how God knows what will be in the future. I think that these words in the Rambam here are specifically directed to the kind of problem that you're raising. So God did tell Abraham what will be. He did tell Moses what will be about the future of the Jewish people. So here you see God demonstrating. You think of it as God demonstrating knowledge, as I told you. Um, and, and indeed, let me just check the Hebrew here. This might be a good example of what my, my son told me. Yeah. Yeah. It means he has all of the capacities of knowing the future without what we would call knowledge. So um, this now c- c- handles a number of other verses in the, in the Torah where God speaks about the future, not where it says that he stops people from doing something. That was a brutal challenge. Here it's where his statement is that they will do, and it sounds like they cannot do otherwise because he says this is what's going to happen. He's going to say that this this is what's going to happen. And the answer is that even if what he said carried some kind of weight that it should happen, but each individual wouldn't be able to use it as an excuse, because, um, because the circumstances, uh, because he could, have, he could have chosen otherwise. Now, I guess I'll just finish by putting in one, one detail here about free will and how God runs the world, which, which may be uh, useful here. Uh, let me give you a human example, and then, and then I'll show you how it works with God. Uh, George and I are friends. George likes ice cream, and he has preferences for, te- for uh, flavors. The preferences are vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry, in that order. And George tells me, uh, I'm going to go buy ice cream now. So I think, "Uh uh-huh, he's going to the ice cream store, he's going to buy vanilla. I don't want him to buy vanilla. I I have my reasons. I don't want him to buy vanilla. I have two options. One option is, I'll follow him to the store, and as he walks in, I'll pull out my gun, and I'll put it next to his head, I'll say, George, no vanilla. (laughs) George will consider his options and he'll buy chocolate, right? That's one. But I have another option. The other option is I have to own a helicopter. So I take my helicopter to the ice cream store. I say, listen to the I say to the guy, how many quarts of vanilla you got? 168. I want 168 quarts of vanilla. Pack them up. So he packs them up, puts them in the helicopter, and I leave. George comes walking in. He says, hey, give me a quart of vanilla. And the guy says, listen, some nut just came in here with a helicopter. <laughs> and he bought up all the vanilla but I have chocolate and strawberry. What will George say? I wanted the vanilla, but okay. It's chocolate and strawberry. I guess I'll take the chocolate. Is he exercising free will? Of course he is. He has two options and he chose the one he wanted. I just engineered the circumstances that the one he wants is the one I want him to choose. Couldn't God do the same thing? Without taking away anyone's free will, without forcing anybody to do anything, Couldn't God engineer the circumstances so that the person with his free will chooses what God wants him to choose? Isn't that a way that God could make it come true without taking away free will? I think that happens a lot of the time. That God puts us in choice situations where we will freely choose what he wants us to choose because that's what's necessary for the next step or necessary for its impact on other people. That's a way of gerrymandering or programming free will to make the choices that God wants. I, 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 I haven't been able to work out philosophically whether there's a kind of situation crafted so that God can't do that. You know, something where different people's lives inter- intersect and if I do it this way, I lose, lose that guy, that one. If I do it this way, I lose that one. There's no way I can get everybody to work. My, my intu- philosophical intuition tells me probably if you're smart enough and detailed enough, you can work out of such a situation. But for the vast majority of, of, of human circumstances, God can get the free will decision that he wants by creating circumstances that... Uh, let me ask you a question. Somebody puts a gun to a Jew's head and says, batter the idol or you'll die. Does the Jew have free will? Yeah. Of course he does. People... 
Hundreds of thousands of people throughout the world's, world's history have chosen to die rather than to do what the oppressor says. Jew, non-Jews. They say, no, I don't do that. I will not do that. Tell me where your comrades are. Sorry, I will not do that. I'll, you'll kill me. You'll kill me. I'm not doing it. Only the consequences of his actions and his options have been narrowed. His options now are do what the oppressor says and live with the rest of your life or not. That cuts out like half of his life, but he still has free will. So even putting someone under pressure like that may not, I mean, a person, it could be that when the person sees the gun, he goes to pieces. You know, he just becomes incoherent and can't, can't, that can happen also. He can panic, but not everybody panics. So even putting the Jewish people or a group of people under terrific pressure and then the pressure leading them to do what they do doesn't mean that they don't have free will. So God has, I think, a great deal of flexibility to manipulate what happens in the world without taking away free will. I think that has to be taken into account. Yeah? Is there any chance that you can, for example, God engineers these two choices for you? Is there any chance that you fail to choose? That you stay in a limbo? Well, <laughs> that would be a third choice. You know, there's a, there's a, a philosophical joke those people who, who, who don't believe in free will, I, I read this in John Searle, maybe it's in other philosophers as well, you know, the, the determinist who doesn't believe in free will comes into a restaurant, and the waiter says to him, we have in this restaurant feet, uh, um, meat and fish. Which would you like? And the customer, who's the philosopher, says, you know, I don't believe in free will. I'm just going to sit here and wait and see what I choose. Because it's going to happen by itself, you see. Now, the joke is, he's decided to sit and wait and see what he chooses, hasn't he? So he hasn't avoided free will, because he could have given an order, and he said, no, I won't give an order. Didn't he choose not to give an order? So the, I, the idea is that free will is sort of inescapable, but here the point is, you had fish, meat, and don't order. That's also a choice. So, so when a person doesn't choose A or B, he chooses to not choose. That's also a choice. So it's always an exor exercise of free will. Okay, but for example, if God wants to lead you somewhere, let's say it's a life, uh, a li life changing decision, like you said, to the next step, is is God also thinking that you have uh, the choice of not choosing? Sure. And that lead you. I mean, God knows what your choices are, and God knows what your psychology is, and God knows your choices in the future. If we're talking about God knowing, then he knows what choices you'll make. So I don't see why that's, why that's you know, so terribly, I don't, I don't know what the relevance of that is to the point at issue. The point at issue is only that, by manipulating the circumstances, he can bring about what he was. So let's, let's take Germany between the wars. and the, the, People want to say they were landlocked, they had no access to the sea, they were... Uh, suffering from the reparations that they had to pay. They had ruinous inflation, and that's why there was a Second World War. Maybe. And maybe those circumstances were gerrymandered the guy by, to put the Germans under pressure. We don't say that they escaped responsibility because those circumstances were there. They're difficult circumstances, but that's not a reason for killing millions of people to take over the whole of Europe and eventually the whole of the world. So... God knew that, they, that these circumstances would lead them to war, but that doesn't, re doesn't re uh, remove the responsibility from them for having chosen to go to war. Mary, you want to ask something? No. Oh, okay. All right, gentlemen, have a wonderful Shabbos. Shabbos, Shabbos. See you on Sunday. Shabbos.